Welcome to Yin Yoga Lifestyle. I am your host, Colette Darville, cultivating our body's resilience and inner silence and its application to all aspects of your life. Let's become enlightened and enjoy the power of intuitiveness and creativity. listening to Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and the soul. Hello and thank you for joining us today. I am your host, Colette Darville, and this is Yin Yoga Lifestyle. So now let us take a deep meditative breath. Inhale, so. Exhale, hum. Dr. Charles Benz, Ph.D., is an author, speaker, and wellness consultant specializing in the prevention and reversal of chronic disease. He is the founder and president of Healthy at Work, Inc., a wellness education and consulting company focused on improving the health of employees. The company provides workshops on a wide range of health topics. Dr. Benz has written nine books and over 300 articles, including Healthy at Work, Your Pocket Guide to Good Health. In today's third and final podcast of this three-part series, Dr. Benz will be sharing with us solutions such as thermography and safe practices to protect ourselves from the harmful radiation many of us are exposed to on a daily basis. Welcome back again, Dr. Benz, to Yin Yoga Lifestyle. Thank you, Colette. This is uh, <laughs> I, I, it's been a great series so far. I've enjoyed it a lot, and uh, I feel like uh, your listeners are getting some good information, and I hope they feel the same way. Yeah, I'm. I'm really. I'm really. Uh, uh, I'm really appreciative of your spending this time getting this information out um, to so many people, and. Um, you know, our last podcast, you explained the dangers of radiation, uh, but you not only explained our challenges, you offer solutions to our radiation overload and exposure. What are some of the immediate changes we can make? Well, you know, some of the things that we talked about have to do with avoidance, but I think that uh, if a person feels that they have been living in a big city where there's lots of exposure to radiation as opposed to being out in the country where there's a lot less, Mm. um, they they actually could get a series of tests. Uh, And and if they're sensitive to uh, radiation, these tests are the ones that doctors use to find out uh, how much damage is being done by uh, their sensitivity to electromagnetic radiation. Uh, Then the last program we mentioned, the 8-OHGD test, Mm-hmm. That's a kind of a test of, of DNA damage uh, done by oxidative uh, problems of pesticides and other toxins and radiation. <clears throat> but there's another one called the microRNA test. And the microRNA test uh, looks at seven different markers, and it measures the, the, the biomarkers that are specifically related to a response to body full-body radiation. And so this is one that actually can tell you if you've had a, a uh, hospital visit and you've been exposed to a lot of radiation through CT scans and, and other and x-rays, this will tell you whether those immediate sort of one-time exposures have caused any damage uh, to your cells. And there's wow. another one they call the DCA. It's the dicentric uh, chromosome assay. And this is a series of tests that looks at exposure to ionized radiation. Mm. And uh, then there's Another one called the Galactin-3 test, and this is a test of uh, how proteins change as they're subjected to various forms of toxicity, including radiation, and these proteins will actually start to uh, form uh, that are called Galactin-3 level proteins, and these are the precursors to the development of cancer and heart disease. So if you have elevated galactin-3 levels, that means your cells are starting to move towards fibrosis. Mm. Fibrosis is the beginning of this march towards disease. So it's another one that's unique. in Each one of these tests looks at a different mechanism. And the final one is a radiation-specific diagnostic test. Um, It's called the Comet, Comet series. 
and and these look at again uh, different kinds of radiation and how much impact they're having on, on your cells. So there's at least five tests there that anybody who was concerned could say, I would like to have one or more of these kind of tests. If I had to pick two of them, I would pick the Galactin-3 test and the 8-OHDG test. Those are the two that give you the best overall picture of what's going on with toxicity in your body. In your body. And, you know, and for many of us, and I know we had we talked about this in um, in the uh, uh, podcast two of this three-part series, and um, you talked about x-rays and you talked about MRIs and um, mammograms. And, you know, a lot of people are, you know, um, they think that that's the only way to see what's wrong in the body. Uh, and is there another way to detect cell damage and disease before it's too late? Well, those are the tests that I kind of re was referring to, but in yeah. this case, uh, uh, thermography is the, is the one that I think, uh, would help the most, the most people, especially women with mm -hmm. regard to breast cancer, which I think is the number one health risk of most women and health yeah. concern. And I think because mammograms, are so are so uh, aggressive in terms of the amount of radiation exposure that the, that women are subjected to, and and they're such an inaccurate test. I mean, even the digital mammogram, uh, which is better than the others from the past, it's still going to give you too much radiation, and um, the pain. I mean, I haven't experienced the pain myself, but I know a lot of women in my life that say it's one of the most painful things that they've ever experienced. Right. Um, so. What they need to know is that these mammograms, they're only about uh, 65%, 70% accurate. That means right. there's a lot of false positives. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have a lot of uh, fatty tissue or if you have, cell, uh, if you have uh, uh, implants in your breast, mammograms have a really hard time seeing it. And so this, this creates a lot of difficulty for people getting, them getting an accurate picture. Well, we know that thermography has been approved by the FDA for the last 25 or 30 years. Goodness. But it's approved as an adjunct. In other words, they mm -hmm. wouldn't let it be approved as the first line of defense because they don't want to jeopardize the money being made by General Electric and Philips and the other companies that make the mammograms. And yeah. so they'll say to them, well, you can get your mammogram, but then, you know, if you want to get the thermography as a kind of a backup, but that's, that's, this is the whole point because mammograms need 4 billion cells in order for, and it takes 10 years for 4 billion cancer cells to go from one cell to 4 billion. It takes 10 years Gosh. to get to that point. And an MRI, an ultrasound rather, takes, Two billion cells, so it's twice as good as the mammograms in terms of seeing things sooner. But you're still going to see it when the cancer is already developed. But with thermography, what you're seeing is 200 cells that are starting to heat up and starting to create a profile of vascular expansion and heat increase. And so now all of a sudden you've got this picture that's like 95% accurate. This is where the spot in your breast are starting to create a situation. Mm -hmm. It's not a prediction. It's not a diagnostic tool for cancer. Yeah. It's a physiological test to find out what your physiology is doing, what your cells are doing. But if you have a, a red spot or a white spot on a thermography, it's been digitally identified. Now, you can, you can go back to the doctor. A functional medicine doctor will detoxify you. Yeah. Uh, they'll put you into a stress reduction program. They'll put you into a healthy diet program. They'll put you into some supplements. And at the end of three months, you can have another thermography. 90% of the time, the spot is gone. Gosh. Cells have returned to normal. Yeah. Now, if it doesn't happen uh, in, in three months, you just stay with the program, and usually within 10 months, uh, 6 to 10 months, you get 100% reversal of those 200 cells that started to, to heat up. So this is pre-cancer, and, 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 and so it may take another year, two, three, for those cells to actually move to the cancer state. So you're getting an, a, an analysis of, of the breast cells 
that's eight to 10 years ahead of anything that mammograms can do or that ultrasound can do. What woman doesn't want that? And we need it for women in their late 20s because that's when these things start to show themselves. Yeah, I, it, this is, uh, but there's a lot of women that don't even know what thermography is. You know, they've never heard of it. And I think that it's time. It's time for um, women to be um, educated in these, the alternative ways that they can, um, that they can protect themselves. And, um, you know, and you, you did talk about, uh, you did talk about diet and nutrition in past podcasts. Um, um, are there things that women can do um, on a daily basis uh, that can protect them uh, themselves against breast cancer? Well, sure. Breast cancer and, and any disease that might be uh, kind of precipitated by exposure yeah. to radiation. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the first things you, they, they have to realize is that uh, levels of vitamin D are one of the most crucial things that any woman can do to yeah. test your vitamin D levels. Because we now know through two different studies from different medical schools that women who have high levels of vitamin D3, somewhere between 50 and 90 nanograms per milliliter, have a 75 to 80% reduced risk of breast cancer. Wow. So, so how much is that on a day? How much? So if it's liquid, how many drops or um, if you're well, taking a pill, what is that? Well, it's, we don't know because we don't wow. know where you live. If, if you oh, live I see. In a, in a, in a, in an area where it's all sunshiny and you get out in the sunshine every once yeah. in a while because, you know, the best place to get the, uh, the vitamin D3 is from the sun. But mm -hmm. who goes out into the sun, takes 70% of their clothes off. Right. Uh, that, would be a, that would be a bikini. And yeah. stays in the sun for 20 to 30 minutes until their skin, their skin is pink right. because that's when you've actually, there's cholesterol underneath the skin. And this cholesterol, when it's exposed to the ultraviolet light, gets gets create, gets uh, turned into vitamin D3. And so you can get like 20,000 international units of vitamin D3 from a 20 to 30 minute exposure when you don't put the sunscreen on. This yes. is the key. You, yes. you put the sunscreen on, you've ruined your opportunity to get this vitamin D3. Right. So if you get the test, and you find out, okay, I'm 40 or lower. The doctor will say, ah, oh, that's no problem. 40 is okay. 40 is not okay. 30 is not okay. Because anything below 50, it, we now know from clinical studies, gives you an increased exposure to some of these diseases like breast cancer and like viruses. I yes. mean, the coronavirus is the same. I mean, people with the highest levels of vitamin D3 have the lowest risk of, breast, of, uh, of getting exposed to uh, flu and viruses. Right. So get the test first. Then if you have levels below 50, then you can start to gradually take like 100, like 1,000 uh, international units a day. Liquid's better. All right? The liquid form is yeah. because these things come in different forms, powder, tablets, liquid, gel, Powder is the best. Liquid gel is the best. So a thousand a day. You do that for six months, and then you see what your levels are uh, when you when you get tested again, or at the end of a year. Because what we what we now know is genetically, a lot of people have a difficulty absorbing vitamin D three, and so if you have this, and you can actually get these tests, genetic mm -hmm. tests, to find out whether you have a vitamin D three deficiency, likely because you have this genetic marker. It's called SNPs, the single nucleotide polymorphism. You, you have that SNP that, that prevents your body from absorbing vitamin D3, then you're probably going to need higher levels. So right. what we recommend for people in that situation is they get a vitamin D3 shot. In other words, ah. if you haven't been able to do it, raising your, or, your uh, oral levels, then you get a vitamin D3 shot, especially right before the flu season. You can get 50,000 international units. You can get 100,000 international units. That shocks your vitamin D3 receptors in your body. And they go, whoa, wait a minute. Something <laughs> just happened here. I'm going to stand up and pay attention. <laughs> and so now when you take your oral uh, vitamin D3, your receptors are going, that's great. We see that.